So welcome everyone to Sustainability Speaker Series and thank you for coming out today. So please help yourself to tea or water in the kitchen area at the back. I just started the kettle, so it should be good to go. And then just letting you know that today after the presentation, um, we have, I invite anybody out to ask questions at the microphone. It's just going to be the microphone here. Paige is just pointing to it there, just because we're on Zoom today. So before we start, I just want to make an acknowledgement here. So we are gathered today on Treaty 6 territory and the homeland of the Métis. So on behalf of the Saskatoon Public Library, we pay respect to the Indigenous ancestors of this place. So as an organization that played an important role in the settlement of Saskatoon, and as a key memory institution, we acknowledge our responsibility to respond in meaningful ways to calls to action. So this program tonight can only happen because of the partnership the library has with the Saskatchewan Environmental Society, who work hard to find knowledgeable speakers month after month. So I invite Nancy, that's over here, from the Saskatchewan Environmental Society to come up and introduce tonight's speaker. Good evening. Welcome to the Sustainability Speaker Series presentation for October. I'm Nancy Howes and volunteer with the Saskatchewan Environmental Society. Um, the Environmental Society has worked on environmental issues in the province for over 50 years and a wide range of issues, including climate change, renewable energy generation, opposition to nuclear power development, protection of Saskatchewan water sources, and preservation of important wild spaces and habitat. We invite you to become a member, and there's papers at the table for that for that purpose. Uh, and also a newsletter, um, which has information on ways uh, society is working toward the world in which all needs can be met in sustainable ways. You can sign up for receiving the newsletter um, on a sheet that way too. Um, we, do, uh, we do like this also if you want to be a reminder of the next uh, events in this series, you can uh, sign a sheet for that. Our speaker this evening is Dr. Ali is joining us electronically from the ground. Emily is a professor in the Department of Geography and Environmental Studies at the University of Toronto. She has studied the power and influence of the fossil fuel industry in an important judicial case. She obtained access to information on financial support of the University of Regina research and programs by the fossil fuel industry. She has also worked on a just transition for workers as our economy changes to reduce greenhouse gases emissions. Emily has an undergraduate degree in international studies from the University of Saskatchewan, and a master's in social justice and equity from Brock University, and a PhD in human geography from the University of Toronto. The title of her presentation is <laughs> How much should the Saskatchewan government? Okay, um, first off, thanks very much um, for the invitation to speak tonight and uh, to Carol Chubb in particular, who I was um, communicating with. And um, I am coming to you tonight from um, Regina, the traditional territories of the Anishinaabe the um, Nahiawak, the Nakoda, Dakota, Lakota, and also the homeland of the Métis Michif Nation. Um, I was asked to speak about um, fossil fuel subsidies to the oil industry um, in Saskatchewan. And I, initially I had asked maybe if I could broaden it to sort of support, um, government support for the industry. And so I thought I would at the end of the presentation, widen it a little bit to um, some of the other ways that the government gives support to the oil industry that aren't necessarily considered um, fossil fuel subsidies. So we'll go with what we have. Um, the information, as you'll see, is uh, not all from the same year. And one of the problems in looking at this topic is that the Saskatchewan government in particular hasn't always disclosed in the same way as other governments about the volume of their subsidies. 
So um, I'll give you a picture tonight and certainly you can have, um, you know, you can follow up yourselves uh, with some of the organizations and reports that I, I'll talk about. Um, and yeah, I guess we'll start there. <laughs> so um, the reason that I framed the conversation in terms of how much should the Saskatchewan subsidize the fossil fuel industry is um, the normative question given the need for an energy transition. So um, that question looked very different uh, 40 years ago than it does today. And basically the conversation that academics are having right now about fossil fuel subsidies are within this wider context of the need to transition to zero emitting um, economies. And this comes, as probably most of you know in the audience, um, especially uh, as a result of the uh, 2018 report by the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change titled Global Warming of 1.5 Degrees, which basically said, if we want to keep global warming to um, closer to 1.5 degrees, under two degrees, if we want to have a good chance of um, keeping global warning, warming to under two degrees, then we need to decrease emissions by 45% below 2010 levels by 2030 and get to net zero by 2050. So this was again a 2018 report. Um, a lot of work has been done since then, for example, by the International Energy Agency mapping uh, pathways to uh, net zero and by other agencies as well, looking at how this could be accomplished. Needless to say, um, you know, we haven't got very far, actually. Um, we're getting really close to 2030 now. Um, and we are nowhere near globally, again, the 45 percent um, reduction in global emissions um, that would be needed in order to be on the pathway uh, to net zero by 2050 and avoid some of the worst effects of global warming. So I won't go into the details about what over two degrees looks like, but um, many of you have probably heard, you know, some of the critical thresholds. And of course, all of this is based on modeling and we don't know exactly um, what the climate and what the um, ecosystems are going to look like at various uh, levels of global warming. And it seems like most of the scientific reports um, have been um, too conservative um, with the effects. And so we're seeing like critical thresholds already being surpassed. I don't want to spend too much time on that today. It can get um, quite depressing. But um, anything that we would witness with global um, climate change, really, you know, whether it's from, um, you know, loss of biodiversity and species to uh, effects of warming um, ocean temperatures, all of that are sort of massively um, uh, increased after two degrees. So, you know, there's a critical need to keep global warming below two degrees, and that was really pushed for by specifically um, developing an island nations through the um, intergovernmental um, uh, negotiations, for example, the Paris Accord um, around this time as well. So I'll just say that, you know, we'll come back to this at the end, but that's the context in which I'm trying to answer the question, like, what is an appropriate level of um, subsidize, subsidization for the oil industry, because it is quite different when we put it in the context of um, needing to get to net zero. And as I said, I'll come back to that um, a little bit closer to the end of the presentation, but it, needless to say, it's important to keep in mind. Um, and just to give you a picture of what this means, like in Canada, uh, this is, again, you'll see different dates across this presentation. We're always at least two uh, years behind in terms of having data because it's report there's a two year lag in the reporting of the data, I could have probably found a 2022 graph uh, or a graph that goes up to 2022 but this one to 2021. Um, we can see that the oil and gas industry even nationally in Canada makes up a huge percentage um, of our national greenhouse gas emissions and that percentage is growing. Um, so 28% of national emissions come from the oil and gas industry alone. That's not from burning the oil and gas, that's just from producing it. 
Um, and, you know, worryingly, a few years ago, for example, the same year as that 2018 report came out from the IPCC, um, the Canadian Association of Petroleum Producers released a report that looked at their crude oil forecast, um, and they suggested that they were planning to increase production 33% over uh, 2018 levels by 2035. So the question is really like, how much more oil can we produce? Um, and do the industry's plans line up with, um, again, the need to transition uh, to net zero economies? Um, there's other interesting research that's been done sort of looking at the global carbon budget. Um, and some researchers have suggested that just the oil that is um, uh, that is possible to extract from the tar sands in Canada would eat up 80 per, 85% of the total global carbon budget, um, which is allowable uh, to keep um, under a scenario of two degrees of warming. And so it's critically important, I think, that we um, really arrest um, the oil production in Canada um, and fossil fuel subsidies really play uh, an important part in that. So just to give you a few more stats here um, in terms of uh, the greenhouse gas sectors on a national level, uh, in 2021, the largest emitters nationally were oil and gas at 28% and the transport sector at 22%. So those are both directly tied to fossil fuels. Um, and if we look again over the course um, of that graph from 1990 to 2021, we can see that certain industries increase um, their uh, contribution to the national greenhouse gas emissions. Oil and gas increases 88 by 88%, transport by 27%, buildings by 21%, and agriculture, which is also really important in Saskatchewan, by 39%. Um, and we do have other industries that are decreasing their emissions, for example, electricity, um, heavy industry from 1990 to 2021, down 22%, electricity 45%, waste and others down 14%. Um, but you can see that uh, sort of any savings that are um, that we come by in some of these other industries are more than made up for by emissions in the oil and gas and transport uh, sectors in particular, but also in buildings and agriculture. Um, this is sort of the Paris Accord, again, which um, sort of committed the world to keeping greenhouse, uh, I don't know why you can see my thing there, but it doesn't really matter, <laughs> um, that committed uh, committed the world to keeping global warming under two degrees. Um, we sort of wondered in a paper that we published a while ago uh, in policy options um, about like, could Canada get to its Paris commitments, uh, which was 30% below 2005 levels by 2030. Um, could it do that without Saskatchewan? And looking at sort of the greenhouse gas emissions per capita um, in Saskatchewan, we have a small population, but compared to the rest of Canada and the world average, um, the per capita emissions in Saskatchewan are really astronomical. And that has a lot to do with our own oil industry. And again, this idea that like, while some sectors are lowering their emissions, some economies, some provincial economies have been quite successful at lowering emissions, uh, yet Alberta and Saskatchewan have so drastically increased their emissions um, over the course of, the, in this case, looking at the Copenhagen Accord, um, that, you know, Canada's net emissions have been rather stagnant, and so anything that um, is being done in the rest of the country is more than being made up um, by um, an increase in emissions in uh, in Saskatchewan and, and Alberta in particular. So this is just um, some Saskatchewan's emissions profile that I pulled off the Saskatchewan government's website. Uh, we can see uh, so a dip here around 2020 um, with the uh, pandemic, which dramatically actually oil production decreased quite dramatically that year. Um, and is starting to tick upwards again. But these are again, just emissions. We also saw um, in the wake of the 2014 
drop in oil prices, a little bit of a lag here, but that 2016, um, I think is well relatable to the decline in, in oil production. Um, and so uh, Saskatchewan, again, still very much um, a large contributor um, to uh, Canada's overall emissions profile, even though our oil and gas sector um, is so small compared to, for example, um, Alberta's. So I guess I should have showed my slides in a different way here because you're seeing all the background things, but I'll forge on now that it's um, displayed in this way. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a sense of Saskatchewan's oil industry, uh, it's the second largest oil producer in Canada and the sixth largest oil producing uh, jurisdiction in North America. Um, in 2023, Saskatchewan produced 457,000 barrels per day. Um, Alberta, just to give you a contrast, Alberta produced 4.3 million uh, barrels per day. So nowhere near the size, of course, of Alberta's um, oil industry, but surprisingly still um, really polluting um, for the size of it. 65% of production is exported to the United States um, and Saskatchewan is producing around 10% of Canada's overall total um, oil production. Uh, and to give you a sense again about the size of that production, 457,000 barrels per day in 2023. Um, Alberta in 2020 had 422,000 barrels per day in their conventional oil industry, plus then uh, close to 3 million barrels per day in the oil sands. So basically Saskatchewan's oil industry is about as big as um, Alberta's conventional um, oil industry. Um, okay. Where does it happen? Um, these are some of the major producing formations in Saskatchewan. Um, and one of the reasons that Saskatchewan's oil industry is so emissions intensive is because a lot of the oil that we produce is heavy oil. Heavy oil uh, needs to be upgraded. Uh, Saskatchewan's heavy oil isn't classified as tar sands, but it's quite close um, in terms of its gravity. Um, and therefore, um, again, you know, very emissions intensive to produce. It needs to be upgraded significantly. If we're talking about the back end formation, which boomed um, several years ago and kind of came to an end in two, it, the boom came to an end in 2014 uh, with the oil price crash. Um, that's light oil, but um, we don't have a significant gathering, gas gathering infrastructure in Southeast Saskatchewan. So what was happening was a lot of oil was being fracked um, and extracted. And alongside the oil, they would have to also produce the natural gas. Um, and because they didn't have the gas gathering infrastructure, um, a lot of that gas was um, in the better case uh, flared off um, and in the worst case vented right into the atmosphere um, and uh, as methane and methane is a really potent greenhouse gas, especially if it isn't um, combusted uh, first. So just to give you a sense of where it's happening, you know, we have different types of oil from uh, light oil to heavy oil. Um, we have um, different types of extraction as well, including steam assisted gravity drainage, one of the technologies that they use in certain areas of the tar sands. Um, and yeah, everything in between, I guess. Okay, I feel like I'm speaking very quickly. So I'll take a sip of my tea here. Okay, so we've already established, you know, Saskatchewan's oil industry second largest in Canada. It's, you know, not very big compared to Alberta's, but yet about comparable to Alberta's conventional um, oil industry. Uh, why is it important to the province? Uh, it depends again, which year you pull the statistics. So for example, in, 2020, in budget year 2023-24, um, the oil and gas industry only contributed 5% to provincial revenues. But if we look at other years, um, it contributed as much as 23.8% of provincial revenues in 2009 at the height of the oil boom. 
um, and again, down to very low number uh, today. So it has contributed quite a bit um, to provincial revenues in the past in some good years. About 2.4% uh, of the provincial workforce in 2019, uh, we have seen a sort of decline in its contribution to the provincial workforce um, since the beginning of the pandemic. Um, about 14% of provincial GDP in 2021, again, that number has been higher in different years, um, but uh, that's probably close to where it is now uh, yet. Right, so uh, these relatively small numbers in terms of the workforce contribution, the provincial revenues, 25% of Saskatchewan's greenhouse gas emissions in 2021. Uh, so this is, you know, a problem in the sense of, again, the contribution of the oil industry to these things, provincial revenue, GDP, provincial workforce, um, is much smaller than what we're paying sort of in greenhouse gas emissions. So that brings me then, I guess, with that little overview of um, a little bit about Saskatchewan's oil industry um, to the topic tonight about fossil fuel subsidies in particular. And I thought I'd start with a definition of a fossil fuel subsidy. And this definition accords with the World Trade Organization's definition um, in their agreement on subsidies and countervailing measures. Um, there are different definitions of subsidies, um, depending on what kinds of sources you um, consult, but for our purposes tonight, it'll be a financial benefit that's given by a government to a business group or industry. So it is a financial benefit. It can be in the form of direct handouts or of funds, or it is in the form of direct handouts of funds. I'll talk later about some sort of um, more indirect ways in which the oil industry is supported uh, by the government. But if we're talking about a subsidy, we're really talking about direct uh, transfer of funds. And that can be through things like cash or grants. It can be through things like loans or loan guarantees, um, through tax credits or tax breaks. Those are the main sort of uh, mechanisms. And we'll talk tonight about, or I guess I'll talk tonight about both subsidies for producers, so um, for the fossil fuel industries in terms of extraction, um, also for transportation of fossil fuels. Uh, actually, I won't talk too much about that tonight, but certainly, um, the, you know, if we're talking about pipeline um, uh, subsidies, there have been a few really big ones, especially at the national level. Um, but we can also talk about fossil fuel subsidies in terms of um, handouts to consumers as well. And I'll touch on some of those tonight um, too. I am myself most concerned about um, subsidies for producers because if we go back to that need that I um, put up at the very beginning of the presentation, the need to phase out uh, fossil fuels in order to meet um, sort of net zero um, emissions, I think what we really need to do um, is to stop producing fossil fuels. Uh, often, you know, there's a focus really on the consumption side of fossil fuels, but really um, decades of focus on telling consumers to consume less hasn't resulted in the kinds of um, decreases that we need. And so a lot of the academic and policy uh, advocacy groups are now suggesting that we need to really focus on the producers of fossil fuels rather than the consumers but I can come back to that too. And some of the theory around that if you want in the question period. So um, one way in which fossil fuel subsidies manifest is when um, governments reduce their subsidy, or sorry, reduce their royalties, right? So um, resource oil and gas royalties have varied, you know, very considerably. Um, and in some of the literature, uh, there are people who sort of crunch the numbers and come up with an average rate of royalties in these periods. I couldn't find, like there's a ton of literature now about the various different types of subsidies, um, or sorry, the various different royalty regimes today in the fossil fuel industries, but nowhere could I find a sort of average um, royalty rate um, today. So, uh, but even looking historically, we can see of course, um, under the Blakeney government from 1975 to 82, 
Um, this was during a time period, of course, uh, right after, after the oil OPEC shocks, when oil prices were incredibly high. So it makes very much sense um, that Blakeney was able to sort of uh, recuperate some of those windfall, um, ta uh, windfall revenues from the oil and gas industry and, ta and um, tax them at a really high rate. But nevertheless, we see that, you know, during this period that was maybe somewhat exceptional, a 50% average royalty rate, um, that's steadily decreasing um, to 27% under Divine, 17% um, under Romano, and probably um, still much lower today. I'll talk about some of the subsidies that have been brought in um, since then and some of the tax breaks as well. Okay, so... Yeah, I think that's okay. I can, so that's a little bit historically. Um, this is what I could find, one of the more recent um, breakdowns of royalty rates in Saskatchewan. Um, again, that's more recent. This was from um, KPMG, uh, their guide to oil and gas taxation in Canada, 2018. And this is specific to, uh, even though it's the, Alberta, the source down there says uh, Energy Alberta. This was specific to um, Saskatchewan. Each of these, uh, uh, sorry, the royalty rates today are dependent on a well's productivity and the type of oil. Um, and so there's three types, heavy oil, southwest designated oil, and non-heavy oil. And these are then further subdivided into whether it's a, a new uh, whether it's new oil, whether it's third tier oil, whether it's fourth tier oil. So new oil um, is oil produced from an oil well drilled on or after January 1, 1974. Third tier drilled on or after January 1, 1994. Fourth tier after October 1st, 2002. So, you know, the royalty regime is incredibly uh, complex um, today. And uh, the formulas for oil in Saskatchewan, again, are based on sort of this principle that the government retains a base royalty rate um, on a base price, plus a marginal royalty rate um, on the price that exceeds the base price. Um, so uh, again, hard to get a picture of the sort of average um, royalties today, very complex, but you're seeing here um, you know, anything on the base um, royalty rate from 5 to 20%, uh, some of the really old um, oil wells. Uh, but a lot of incentives introduced for uh, newer wells, uh, especially since 2018. So um, in 2002, under Calvert, there were new um, horizontal well drilling incentives um, in the form of a tax cut. So this was when really that back information that I showed you a few slides back was starting to come online with horizontally drilled uh, multi-fracked multi uh, wells or wells with multiple fractures along a horizontal leg. Um, and the government really wanted to incentivize um, new horizontal well drilling. Those wells are really expensive to drill because they have to go a long ways underground um, horizontally. Um, so that came in in 2002, and then since then, really a suite of sort of uh, programs since 2018, um, the Saskatchewan Petroleum Innovation Incentive, um, a whole bunch of other ones that are listed there on the slide. Hopefully you're in an area that you can see the screen, because um, it probably isn't worth me um, reading all of them, but I noted um, this I took from this report there, Blocking Ambition, um, by the uh, IISD International something for Sustainable Development Institute, sorry, for Sustainable Development. Um, this was a 2002 report, and they noted in that report that the financial estimates, estimates for what these programs cost the government um, are not always included in annual budget documents for Saskatchewan, unlike in Alberta and BC. So, there's less um, sort of transparency around the cost of these programs um, in Saskatchewan and where there is a cost related to that, um, 
that's uh, with full uptake of the program. Okay, so it doesn't necessarily mean um, that uh, it's costing Saskatchewan, for example, 370 million per year for oil and gas processing um, investment incentive, but it could mean it if it's being fully utilized. Um, and we're not so sure about that uh, as well. Um, okay. Uh, oh yeah, and this report also noted that um, there's been a sort of you know proliferation of these different types of incentives, industry incentives, without repealing you know previous ones, and that it's we're sort of due in Saskatchewan um, to take a look at the at the you know full suite of programs that have in, been introduced um, in order to uh, streamline and make sure that you know we're not incentivizing things for example, that we shouldn't be. Um, this finding was also made actually by the province's own auditor um, who noted that there was no clear rationale for certain measures um, and made rec recommendations for reform, um, which the government has only you know, very partially acted on since then. Um, so yeah. I'm sorry, I can't give you more specifics on that. But this report, again, written in 2022, was looking in some ways at some exceptional years because it was focused, you know, around the pandemic. But one of the interesting thing was, things that happened during the pandemic was that um, uh, prov provinces really decided to give away large subsidies to the oil and gas industry um, around the pandemic. And so, uh, there was, this year is the year 2020-21, um, and in this year there was uh, $378 million in oil and gas revenue in the province. Um, and according to um, that IASD report, um, a subsidy of $413.8 million um, going to the oil and gas industry. And you can see it compared to other provinces. Of course, uh, we would expect Alberta's to be a lot higher, but actually Alberta's oil industry is much more than three times the size of Saskatchewan. So if we compare it just to the size of the industry, um, Saskatchewan is subsidizing theirs, um, you know, quite healthily. Um, these were direct transfers for fossil fuels that grew dramatically uh, during, again, the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, but they also include um, some consumer rebates that were awarded as some of these cost relief measures. Um, so, for example, there was a 10% rebate for SAS power customers on their power bills for a few months. Um, that's calculated as part of this overall number as well. Um, Saskatchewan also waived half of the industry portion of the oil and gas administrative levy in 2020, um, which cost them 26 million. Um, and they also extended various other reporting deadlines. So these were measures aimed uh, particularly at extraction. Um, and then that report also looked at the year 2021 22. Um, and you can see that. You know, the subsidy comes down from 413.8 million to 224.4 million that year. Um, and you get a sense again of, of where those um, where those subsidies are coming from. Uh, royalty reductions, tax measures, and direct transfers. So probably this year, 2020-21, was an exceptionally large um, year. Um, but, uh, you know, Saskatchewan is still, um, you know, subsidizing at, at a healthy rate um, after that. We can talk briefly about consumption subsidies, um, which I haven't really mentioned too much about yet. Um, there's the fuel tax exemption for farm activity, which in 2020-21 cost $94 million. There's also the PST exemption for electricity. And of course, we can think of this as a fossil fuel subsidy in Saskatchewan because still, I think about two thirds of our electricity in the province comes from fossil fuels, coal, uh, and natural gas. I can't remember the exact um, breakdown. There is some hydro in Saskatchewan, a tiny bit of 
wind and solar, um, but the majority of our electrical mix is coming from uh, fossil fuels. And I had to, I went back and I tried to figure out if that PSD exemption was ever uh, rescinded. Um, and eventually SAS Power got back to me and said, no, it's true for residential customers, at least um, there's no PSD paid on um, electricity. So one thing I wanted to note here too, since we are really close to the election, um, it, or I guess you could, voting started today. So some of you may have already done that. Um, but one thing that I was really upset about in the NDP platform um, was the huge um, amount of money that they had costed as part of their plan um, to go to a very temporary six month um, um, elimination of the gas tax. So gas tax relief um, for six months, which um, costs, which they estimated would cost about 250 million just for the six months. Um, and um, in their, in the plan that they've published, you know, the, the total cost of that program is really, I would argue, hidden in a note at the bottom of um, the table, but in the 20, in, in this table that they show, um, they only have the six months suspension of the gas tax costing 62.5 million, um, but that's because only one and a half months of the six months falls in the budget year 25-26. So if you think about, um, you know, the full cost of that program, 250 million, it's actually more um, than their, what they've promised in year one um, for education funding. And it's actually double what they promised in year one um, for an increase in health funding. So it costs a lot to subsidize um, consumer, um, to subsidize the consumption of fossil fuels. Okay. Um, I'm going to go on to something else in terms of um, subsidies, and this often isn't calculated in subsidies, but I think because um, there's a danger that um, legacy oil and gas wells, that the liability associated th with those does get transferred directly to provinces. Um, I would like to think about them in terms of subsidies or like potential subsidies, right? Um, liabilities that could, um, that might fall to, to provincial governments in the future. And so I'll just play you um, a really short video here about, um, again, it's focused on Alberta. Almost always these types of things are focused on Alberta. Um, but we have the same problems in Saskatchewan, and as I'll argue a little bit later on, in fact, like the um, the sort of total picture of support for the oil industry is even more in Saskatchewan than it is in Alberta. But this is just a short video on uh, liabilities. Hopefully that's going to play. I did test it beforehand. <laughs> Fires are the urgent problem right now, but new documents reveal another concern in Alberta. A joint investigation by CTV News and the online news site Narwhal reveals growing unease over contaminated sites and orphan wells left behind by the oil and gas industry. As CTV's Alberta Bureau Chief Bill Fortier reports, the province's energy watchdog doesn't actually know how big the problem is. In Alberta's Brazo County, giants of the oil and gas industry tower over the prairies, but many of them haven't moved in a while. Some are orphans. The companies that once owned them are gone. My dad moved here in 1919. Bill and Sylvia Flesher have at least 10 orphans on their land. They've lost tens of thousands of dollars in lease payments and gained an eyesore. You know, you're expecting up money to come in and doesn't come. And we also can't utilize the space in the area that they were. This orphan well is from the 70s. What's left is dangerous to the cattle on Lexia Hansen's property. It's very frustrating and it's very frustrating that the government isn't doing more to ensure that there's a proper program in place. And a joint investigation between CTV News and the Narwhal found the problem is growing 
a freedom of information request turned up internal memos from the Alberta Energy Regulator, or AER, the agency that oversees the oil and gas industry. One document from 2019 shows concern that the number of orphan wells could balloon by nearly 500% from 9,700 to 56,000 because of more companies at risk of folding. The same document calls it a slow motion landslide. The regulator knew that the system had completely fallen apart. Four years later, that worst case scenario has not happened, but this environmental lawyer believes the situation could still go downhill. Eventually that dam is going to break and all those companies are just gonna be fully insolvent. Besides orphans, there are now about 75,000 inactive wells. While companies are required to close them, there are no mandatory timelines or rules on which wells to focus on an internal. Oops. I guess I messed that up. <laughs> Sorry, it was almost over. Um, so the uh, internal memo from AER suggested that the complete um, cost of the Alberta clean up, cleanup could be around 33 billion. Um, and there's smart people studying this that suggest that, of course, that that's an underestimation of, of the total cost of that cleanup. So the question is, like, again, if we're going to phase out fossil fuels, um, if oil prices are um, going to tank, if companies are going to leave their liabilities to the public purse, um, then, you know, that could, again, fall sort of to the public taxpayer. Um, this is something that the provincial auditor in Saskatchewan sounded an alarm bell against around as well. Um, so recommendations were made in the 2012 provincial auditors report, which concluded that the province did not have effective processes to manage the financial and environmental risks uh, related to the future cleanup of oil and gas wells and related facilities in Saskatchewan. Um, and according to the auditor, again, in 2020. 20 sorry 2012 uh, there were uh, about 20,000 legacy well sites um, of which 9,000 were producing wells so these are wells that um, had been uh, producing are cleaned up but are not necessarily uh, assessed by a third-party specialist and might be um, you know leaking or um, otherwise you know impeding um, you know, good use of, of those lands. So in 2022, there were approximately 35,400 inactive wells in Saskatchewan. Now, inactive doesn't mean that they're going to be orphaned or left to um, the public to clean up, but it does mean, you know, they are at higher risk of being um, orphaned. Um, and specifically, you know, oil companies will keep um, sometimes even paying the leases, but not producing those wells in order to get out of their liabilities associated with remediating and cleaning up and shutting down or properly abandoning, as we call it, um, in the industry, those uh, wells. Uh, one of the things that the auditor noted that the Saskatchewan government is um, has done since the report in, 2020, in 2012 um, is that in 2023, they started requiring companies to spend 5% of their estimated total well and facility cleanup costs. So if a company has a total liability, they have to spend every year now 5% of that total liability on actually cleaning up um, uh, wells and other infrastructure. So that's just another thing to think about when we're thinking about fossil fuel subsidies. Um, I thought I would also um, include, uh, oh, did I say that the 33 billion was estimated for Alberta? D it didn't include the, um, the oil sands. I can't remember whether I said that or not. Um, but if we start to include the oil sands, then that looks really big in Alberta. Okay, I thought I would also include just um, something around what we know about uh, federal fossil fuel subsidies. Um, and it's interesting because Canada did commit to phasing out, quote unquote, inefficient fossil fuel subsidies. Um, it committed to doing that way back in 2009 as part of um, a G20 commitment. Um, in 2021, they moved up their deadline to complete this by 2023. Um, but they've insisted on this definition of uh, inefficient uh, subsidies. 
Um, and so these are um, subsidies that um, they deem as, um, I'm trying to find, I wrote down the exact definition that they're using here, but I don't uh, see it now, but um, subsidies that they deem as uh, not contributing basically to um, reducing greenhouse gas emissions within the um, fossil fuel sector. So they've been able to slip in here um, things like subsidies to carbon capture, um, for example, because um, those are meant to sort of green the industry. I could spend a long time critiquing the actual um, the actual um, track record of carbon capture, uh, but that's a whole other um, a whole other other topic here. Uh, I was going to go to this website to show you um, just environmental defense does a really good job every year of sort of tracking what they can see um, in terms of total federal um, fossil fuel subsidies. Uh, and they usually they have a report for each uh, year. But right now my hyperlink is not working well. Uh, so I won't actually go to that report. And because we're getting close to the end of time here, um, I think I should move on. But they um, reported in 2024 that there have been at least 5.537 billion in federal uh, fossil fuel subsidies. But again, noting that um, a lot of the subsidies are announced without actual costing. This is another site that you can go to to look at it from a different angle. Um, and this is, uh, I had here, the country of Canada. You can look at different uh, mechanisms of support. So you can look at um, just uh, direct transfers of government funds. You can look at uh, induced transfers or price supports um, and other things here. You can break it down in many different ways if you're interested in looking at that um, yourself. But you can look um, at this screenshot just at, sort of the level, level of federal um, fossil fuel subsidies for all uh, fuel types um, from 2010 to 2022. And you can see, you know, that it goes down for a while um, and starts to increase a lot again in 2020, 2021, 2022. And this is again, I think attributable to the ways in which the federal government is trying to invest in these technologies like carbon capture, uh, like hydrogen, like some of the other um, so-called, you know, ways to sort of green the fossil fuel industries. Um, and so this brings me close to the end around, um, given all of this information, you know, what is an appropriate level of subsidization for this uh, industry? Well, if we go back to the original um, problem of the need to, or the need to get to net zero emissions, I think many smart people have made the arguments very well um, that a lot of the techno technological solutions like carbon, carbon capture and storage, um, like uh, uh, blue hydrogen, so the production of hydrogen using fossil fuels, but with carbon capture on it, that these things might appear um, from the outside to decrease um, the emissions associated with those uh, with those, uh, yeah, with the, with production through those methods, but that in reality, you know, a lot of things are being um, hidden, and uh, the, the track record of a lot of these technological solutions is not actually really great. We know that over eighty five percent of um, total greenhouse gas emissions in the world come from fossil fuels. So even if we can produce the fossil fuels without um, producing greenhouse gases, somewhere they're going to be burned. And when they're burned, um, they're also going to emit um, greenhouse gas emissions. So all of that to say, I could have a longer presentation sort of making all of those um, arguments and links, but all of that to say that, you know, when we're talking about phasing out an industry, and especially the supply side approach, um, then no, really no level of um, subsidization of that industry is appropriate, right? Phasing out subsidies is actually a first step um, to phasing out fossil fuels. We can look at alternatives of uh, what we can, if we want to invest in different types of alternatives, but I would even suggest things and 
other smart people have talked about the ways in which even just taxation um, is an effective climate change strategy as well. We don't necessarily need to um, incentivize um, alternatives, but I think like politically it's really important in an era where people are really feeling the cost of living to be able to um, you know, make certain things cheap for people, whether that's public transportation um, or uh, energy efficient housing, et cetera. Um, that can be all part of a sort of positive vision and plan for, um, you know, the coming economy, you could say. So the last thing I wanted to say today is um, around uh, other ways that we support the fossil fuel industry. And I was part of a larger um, uh, federally funded project with colleagues across Western Canada looking at the power and influence of the carbon extractive corporate resource sectors. And this is a little graphic from Bill Carroll's book um, that we all had a part in coming out of that project um, that looks at sort of the power and influence of the fossil fuel industries in terms of uh, their economic power, uh, the ways in which they um, shape the political uh, scene through their activities like lobbying, uh, capturing regulators, uh, moving industry personnel um, from industry through government and back out into industry, um, and through their cultural influence. And we've done, uh, together with Simon Enoch, I've done quite a bit of work on, you know, looking at how the fossil fuel industries have sort of um, reached into things like um, public education, um, and even universities um, in order to, um, you know, fund certain narratives about what the coming economies will look like. And, and of course, they want to maintain this idea that we can reduce emissions while still having um, fossil fuels. So just to give you a sense, um, this is from the Fraser Institute's Canada-US Energy Sector competitive, Competitiveness Ooh, survey from 2023. Um, and in this survey, the Fraser Institute asks oil and gas uh, representatives from oil and gas um, companies to rate sort of their experiences with different jurisdictions in terms of how easy it is um, to produce oil and gas in those jurisdictions. And I'll come back to this slide in one second, but here's um, their 2023 outcomes, and they do this every year, and it looks a little different every year, but Saskatchewan is almost always one of the uh, one of the best places to produce oil and gas across North America. So in 2023, it was the third, it was ranked three out of 17 in terms of oil and gas producing jurisdictions. And what did they rank it based on? I'll come back to this slide now. Things like... Um, how much it costs. So lease payments, royalties, other production taxes, gross revenue charges. So all of those fiscal terms, taxation in general, but also things like environmental regulations. And we've moved in this province toward a system of uh, regulation by declaration. We have defunded um, the, or, or maybe it's better to say not increased funding to uh, the oil and gas regulator while um, oil and gas production and oil and gas drilling has increased um, astronomically. So in effect, right, um, reducing uh, environmental regu regulatory oversight, compliance monitoring, um, all of those things. Um, so you can see their regulatory enforcement is one of the things that they're talking about. Um, the cost of regulatory compliance, like how many things do you have to file uh, as we move in Saskatchewan towards uh, this regulation by declaration um, on a, you can uh, submit on an online portal um, the documents that are required and get an immediate um, approval and license for well drilling uh, as long as you don't have any sort of anomalies um, in your application. Um, and that sort of builds on this history that we have in Saskatchewan of not doing environmental assessment on um, individual oil wells. And well, guess what? Um, you know, companies submit their applications on very small number of oil wells at once. Um, none of them really get reviewed um, in terms of environmental assessment. We don't have any mechanisms to um, 
think about the total cumulative cumulative effect of this industry. Um, and so uh, we have a very permissive right uh, regulatory environment. That's one huge way in which Saskatchewan supports the oil and gas industry, making it um, more efficient for the industry to work, right? Fewer hoops for it to jump through and thereby, you know, costing it less to comply with the regulatory system. So all of these things here in this long list are other ways, right, that provincial and federal governments support the um, oil and gas in um, industry, whether it's from investing taxpayer dollars in quality, quality infrastructure, um, including access roads, power availability, uh, or whether it's, you know, having the Saskatchewan Immigrant Nominee Program easily available to the oil and gas industry to bring in um, lower cost labor, um, or whether it's, you know, ensuring that there isn't um, regulatory duplication between federal and provincial jurisdictions. All of these things are understood by the industry itself as like large um, supports to the industry that make the cost of it producing uh, the make the cost of production uh, more favorable to the industry. So I think just to conclude there, like we could open up this idea of subsidies beyond just these direct um, transfers and think about, you know, the, the really many ways in which um, the Saskatchewan government and the Saskatchewan economy is really supporting a very um, permissive, more so than any other jurisdiction in Canada, um, total system to the oil and gas industry. Okay, so I've talked so much now. Um, and I'll leave it there. I skipped over some things, but hopefully that gives you somewhat of an overview. And I can awesome. take questions. Thank you so much, Emily.